recording, starting webinar. We are live. Great, thank you. And welcome everyone to the September 8th, 2020 regular board meeting of Everett Public Schools Board of Directors. I'm looking for the excitement. I can feel it. School's starting tomorrow. <laughs> I can't tell if there's excitement or exhaustion going on or maybe a little of both. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Will the secretary please call the roll? President Mason? Present. Vice President Lassane? Present. Director Berg? Present. Director Mitchell? Present. Director Nichols? Present. Student Representative uh, Hussein? Present. Student Representative Pilch Besson. She has to unmute. There she is. Looks like her sound might not be working, but we, we see saw, her. Yes, I saw the lips move and say present. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as always, our first item of business tonight is the adoption of the agenda. Dr. Salzman, may you please introduce the agenda? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, Board Directors, and to the public, good evening. Tonight's agenda contains the following, a segment for recognitions, the superintendent's report, a segment for board comments, a segment for public comments, a segment for routine business, a segment for strategic progress monitoring, a segment for information discussion, segment for new business and upcoming agenda items. Since publishing the agenda, there have no changes that have been made. The board may elect to change the order of business by a majority of the vote of the members. Thank you. Okay, everyone just froze. I'm assuming that might have been my internet connection. So is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been approved or it's been moved and seconded to adopt the agenda. Would, is there any discussion? Hearing none, we will move to the vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The agenda is adopted. <laughs> which takes us to recognitions. And tonight we do have a recognition. We actually have two. We have two new administrators that have joined us since our, our last recognition of administrators in July. And I believe, uh, Dr. Salzman, are you going to be introducing these two? Uh, Debbie Kovacs will have the honor tonight to introduce the two new administrators. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Salzman. I am pleased to uh, welcome two new administrators, and I have Dr. Bowden and Dr. Scott who will do the individual introductions. So with that, Dr. Bowden. Perfect, hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, I am very excited tonight because I have the honor of introducing Mr. Anthony Anderson, who is the new director of STEM CTE partnerships and choice programs in our department. Anthony is most excited about joining our team because he is passionate about offering students the opportunity to explore their passions while completing their K-12 public school experience. Um, Anthony comes to us via Florida. He began his career as a technology and business education teacher, helping his students learn about the stock market and rebuilding computers to show the different career pathways in the fields. As an assistant superintendent of middle schools in Duval County, Florida, he helped design the career pathways from elementary high schools, um, to, from elementary to high schools in the district. So he brings to us a plethora of knowledge and experience in helping us to develop um, both our STEM and CTE partnerships as well as choice programs. So I'd like to introduce you to Anthony and I think he has a few words to say. First of all, I would just say thank you for the opportunity to join such a great and um, progressive district. 
Um, looking forward to working with the team that I've joined and looking forward to uh, offering um, opportunities for our students to excel and enjoy their um, educational experience during this time. So really, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and I'm glad to be here. Great, thank you. So I'm up second here and it's my privilege to introduce Kelly Clevenger as the new Executive Director of Special Services. Kelly is a dedicated educator with deep, deep experience, 38 years of experience to be exact. Kelly joins us most recently from the Bellevue School District where she served as the, the Special Education Director since 2013. Kelly has held multiple classroom uh, teaching roles, served as an education director for First Place School, which is a school for students without permanent homes, or um, it's analogous to our, our Kids in Transition program. She served as education director for the Seattle School District in that capacity. She served as an adjunct faculty member for City University as well, so kids and adults. When asked what she's most excited about this new role, Kelly said that it's to continue to make a difference in the lives of students who often need a champion to see their competence and value in our collective society. She said she's pursued the opportunity in Everett because of its commitment to equity and inclusion for all students. So welcome, Kelly. You can say a few words. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I am so uh, equally as excited as Anthony, I think, to become uh, a staff member here in the Everett School District. I'm just really impressed with uh, our equity and inclusion work that we've been doing, and that's one of the things that really drew me here. And um, I have so far been here about eight weeks, and I have a great team to work for with, and I really um, appreciate the opportunity to, um, to lead such a, a wonderful team. Thank you. Thank you both. And on behalf of the board, I wanna welcome both Anthony and Kelly to the district. I know you've been on board, Kelly, for a, a bit here. Um, and thank you for joining us via Zoom. And of course, we all look forward to an opportunity to actually meet you in person and have a conversation real time, <laughs> or not real time, but live. So um, thank you. And with that, we will move to the superintendent's report, Dr. Salzman. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and to our public tonight uh, in my report. First of all, tomorrow is opening day and the most exciting time of the year where our students start a brand new school year. So first of all, students get a good night's sleep. So if you're staying up watching this, we're not gonna be too late tonight because we want you to get a good night rest for tomorrow. And even though we're not gonna see you live and we're gonna see you remotely, we are touching you in our hearts and, and knowing you're gonna do a great job tomorrow, great job. And uh, to our parents, thank you. Thank you for your support and your input over the summer. Because without your input, we wouldn't get to where we are today and to our teachers who, who worked all summer engaging with us and getting ready. Tomorrow's gonna be a great day for you. You get to see new students. And, uh, but we also want you to know that it's gonna take time this week. We want patience for everybody, but this is an exciting time for our principals, our assistant principals, our entire Everett family. Tomorrow's opening day. It's, it's the beginning of the season and I can just feel the energy. I hope everybody else feels the energy. It's gonna be a fantastic year. Nobody predicted us to start remotely, but I can promise you this, it's gonna be fantastic. So I wanted to share that with everybody. And then on a, on a solemn note, uh, we lost an icon uh, in the Everett family, Ernie Brockman, 50 years in public education, in the Everett public school system, 50 years. And, and what a teacher. Uh, when I ran to some people in the community uh, recently, uh, when he passed, they mentioned, did you know Ernie Brockman? Uh, and I did not, but I wish I would have known Ernie Brockman. And to his family tonight, I just want to share as a new superintendent, um, he left a great mark in this district. So uh, all my prayers to his family this time and uh, to do that great service. Uh, I just will always remember hearing about him, but just even the past few days and just going out in the community and talking to people, uh, he was an icon. So uh, Ernie Brockman, you're with us always. Thank you. And that is my report this evening. Thank you. I saw many wonderful um, 
comments on social media myself about his tenure in our district and, and the folks that are now teachers that he taught. So um, he gave some inspiration, I believe. Let's see, we're going to turn to board and I don't know why this is called board comments because it's really board and student representative comments. And rather than put our brand new student representative on the spot, I'll start with the directors. And I'm actually gonna start by just saying, um, good luck tomorrow. I'm just super excited to see how this goes. I know patience is going to be a big part of it. It has been for, what is it, six or seven months now. Um, and I, I just, I'm so looking forward to seeing how this rolls out. I know how much work and effort has gone into the planning of tomorrow and um, it's exciting. And we're gonna be adventuring together. And I also wanna say to my fellow directors, I'm excited to be on this adventure with you. It's been an unusual year, but um, we're gonna figure this out one step at a time. So with that, I'll turn it over to directors. If you just want to give me a little hand wave when you're, if you have something to say or would like to speak. Director Nichols. Yeah, uh, so <clears throat> this last week uh, I spent out in the community. Um, I was at Garfield, Penny Creek and Hawthorne to help hand out Chromebooks. Um, it was amazing to see all the teachers out that were just so excited to see their students, even if it was just from a car window, to catch up with them, see how they were doing. Um, really nice to finally meet some of the principals like principal Stillwell over at Garfield. Uh, I'm going to screw up her name, but Marty Sh <laughs> Shevland over at Penny Creek and principal Nguyen over at uh, Hawthorne. And it was really great. And I look forward to getting out some more. I'm going to be handing out some meals at Whittier this next week um, and continuing to visit schools as we can. Great. Thank you. And director Mitchell. Yeah, I did the same thing that Director Nichols did, both at Gateway, but at Gateway, I passed out t-shirts with the PTA and the leadership. So, so well, and every family, what are these? So you can feel a part of the Gateway family. And we also gotta teach parents the difference between an adult extra large and a child small. So it was fun to like help them learn sizes. But anyway, then at, Gate, at, at Jackson helped pass out uh, the laptops to, um, ninth graders and developed a new process where I said, so what middle school did you come from? So that I could learn if they um, already had a login and password or if they did not. And so that it was what middle school did you come from? Gateway, Heatherwood, then it's your same login and password. Please do that as you drive through the parking lot. Oh, we just moved here. Oh, where'd you move from? What's your school? What was your school like? Welcome to Jackson. Welcome to Everett. And then please go to the IT desk so that they can get your login and password if it wasn't emailed to you and had just one family say, wait, is it all remote? So thank you, Dr. Saltzman and Kathy for getting out lots and lots of messages that we are 100% remote. And it is just sort of a different kind of year, but I do wanna thank all of the teachers and the leaders for the work over the summer getting ready for tomorrow and all of the parents who are going to be at home with their, their children, as well as our community partners that will be helping our students in our school buildings for those parents that have to, have to work. So it's gonna be a challenging day tomorrow, but it really is the best day of the year. So thank you. Great, thank you. Director Berg. Hi, and thank you um, so much. I just wanted to start out with um, a congratulations to Dr. Saltzman for the National School Public Relations Association Award. Um, I know that that was probably, you know, much to do with you as well as Kathy um, with the communication when, uh, you know, this, this public health crisis all started. And, um, and just thank you for that communication because I think it has made a difference in our community. And as we start back up uh, tomorrow, I think parents really do know what's going on. Um, I say that as a parent, um, it's been interesting seeing the emails come in about what to do and where to go. And of course, I'm not able to do that. So I've been sharing that with my, my better half. And um, I will say, uh, like Director Mitchell said, um, it sounds like that process at Jackson was absolutely seamless and wonderful. And um, she came home feeling really good about starting ninth grade at Jackson and feeling a part of a community, even in this new normal. So just thank you to, to all the teachers and directors and everybody who, who have been out there 
making that possible. Um, and just lastly, I guess, as, as a parent in this, um, you know, I've been really um, touched by all the, the communication from the individual teachers to the students, really try to make sure they're on board for next year. So um, just, it's been wonderful. And I'm looking forward to, to the new processes and jumping in head first. Um, and for the adventure that our little t-shirt says, it really is going to be an adventure. Um, and I just, I couldn't think of a better team to, to be in this adventure with. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Director Lassane. <laughs> yes, I would also like to um, congratulate Dr. Salzman and his team for, for, being, for being recognized as the National School Public Relations Association student uh, superintendent to watch that says a lot but you know it, it all has to do with communication and i think you started this year this past year off quite well with putting a lot of information out on the streets being very transparent being open to new technology it was the first time i had the opportunity to learn how to tweet and um it's going to be different tweeting this year but I hope to continue that practice up because it is a method of communications and a lot of people or parents or students especially are very fond of it and are using it quite a bit. Um, it's important that we all continue to learn how to do new technology. And I also wanna welcome the 69 new teachers that we have at Everett Public Schools. I had the opportunity at your breakfast to be able to say a few words of welcome I, I look forward to having the opportunity to look and talk with you in person instead of just on Zoom. Um, it's, it's important too for us to be able to see each other and you to see us. We're here to support you. You are our biggest resource and we wanna make sure that you are, are uh, given all the resources you need to do the job that you, you are doing for our community and our students. Thank you very much. I, I also want to say that this year is going to be a new year with new challenges and opportunities for us. And I'm looking forward to the, to the um, Adventure 2020. I would also like to welcome um, Anthony Anderson and Ke Kelly Clevenger to our district. Kelly, we've had the opportunity of seeing you. Uh, before on Zoom, so I'm looking forward to continuing that until we have a chance, both you and Anthony, of being able to meet in person. And I'm looking forward to that quite a bit because I'm tired of staying in my home. <laughs> I need to get out every now and then. So I'm looking forward to that. So thank you so much for being here and thank you, uh, President Mason, for giving me the opportunity to vent. <laughs> I'm not sure that's venting or just a reflection of how we all feel. <laughs> and now we'll move to student representatives and I'm gonna have our more senior representative go first, if she would like to say a few things. Yeah, of course. Um, so a lot has been going on um, at Everett High School. Earlier this summer, we kind of talked about um, at the Everett Public School District and its involvement in racial sensi sensitivity with the district. Um, we really wanted to attack, especially with recent events, um, how our school district is acknowledging not only the racial inequality in the nation, but in our own schools as well. And of course, statewide, there's huge room for improvement in every school in Washington. Um, but it's nice to be able to kind of set, um, be able to be the leader of that movement, be able to um, kind of deal with it head on. And we sat down with many of the board members here and we presented a list that would hopefully benefit the school district as a whole that hopefully we'll be able to come to that very soon. Um, recently, uh, everything has been picking up speed. Um, for me, at least, whether that be with ASB, leadership, um, meetings or clubs, um, as well as being able to speak at the upcoming WSSBA General Assembly, uh, at Everett, uh, we, and I know Cascade was able to as well sit down with um, Scott Baxovich and plan for the upcoming school year. As student leaders, we we're very, very, very nervous about how everything was going to plan out, homecoming, um, the food drive, and 
having that training um, with our leadership class really gave us hope. Um, if you guys were there, you could, it put a smile on everyone's face, even the seniors. And we're just very excited. Um, tomorrow we're going to be having our senior sunrise where everyone's, re of course, required, required to wear a mask and um, separate. So it's going to be a little bit different, but we'll make it work. And it's just very exciting. So exciting you get to participate in some of the senior activities. Be safe. Social distance. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to welcome our new student representative, Tara. Would you like to say a few words? I don't know if you had audio or not. Yeah, is it, is it working now? Yeah, it is. Great. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so I don't have uh, nearly as much as, uh, as Amina to say, but um, I'm not involved in my school's uh, ASB. I do a little bit of stuff with them, but I'm not a member of ASB. Um, but just from purely a student's perspective, it's been really exciting just to have our schedules out. Um, that's one thing that has felt really normal about this year, and um, that's something that's really enjoyable. So um, who has classes with who and, and comparing schedules and, and that kind of thing. Just as a student's perspective, like it's been kind of heartwarming because it's felt so natural and so normal. And it's, it feels good to say, I have a class with you. And it, it feels kind of more uniting, you know, even though, even though it's over Zoom. Um, I feel like that's brought together a lot of students that have kind of drifted and been doing their own thing all summer. So um, that's been exciting, just having our schedules out. And um, yeah, so, so waking up early, I'm not exactly excited, but I am excited to, uh, to see some of my peers' faces tomorrow. So thank you all for the work you've been doing to make that happen. Thank you. And, um, you know, just as we go through these meetings, we're just interested in your observations and your opinions. So um, whenever those come up, please share with us. Okay, let's see, we are going to move on now to public comments. And do we have any public comments this afternoon? There are no public comments for today's meeting. Okay, okay. thank you, Jamie. That takes us to our consent agenda. Not quite as hefty as last week, uh, but plenty there. Uh, Dr. Salzman, may you please give us an overview of this afternoon's consent agenda? Yes, ma'am, thank you. The board's consent agenda includes repetitive business items such as meeting minutes, personnel actions, expense vouchers, surplus lifts, gifts and grants and recurring contracts. Sometimes includes items that occur less frequently but are of routine business nature. These items are usually reviewed by the board in the Friday report, one or more weeks before the board meeting. This gives directors time to ask staff questions or to consider a discussion about the policy implications of those items. The board votes on the consent agenda in a single motion. By its definition, a consent agenda is not debatable. In the case of the consent agenda, the superintendent's office received no questions regarding items on the agenda. The consent agenda is presented and published for board approval. Thank you. Now I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Would any director like to remove an item from the consent agenda and place it in the new business section of the agenda? Hearing none, we will move to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The consent agenda is approved. Okay, that takes us to our strategic progress monitoring report. And this afternoon we have an update on our summer school. And I believe Dr. Lancaster, Dr. Willard and Chad Golden are gonna help us out here. Uh, okay, well, um... Dr. Golden is not here today, but it is myself and Dr. Willard who will be sharing. Um, just do you guys see the PowerPoint presentation here? Yes. Yes, you do. Fantastic. So I'm really excited to share uh, some of the great accomplishments for summer school this year. Our objectives tonight is to provide you with an overview of the number of participants and a little bit of the happenings of how we um, made it work in the virtual environment in each of the programs that we ran and then show the impact of the summer uh, learning on student achievement and high school graduation. Uh, the strategic goals that we will touch upon tonight is that each student will graduate uh, ready 
um, high school ready for college career and life with 21st century skills. It's providing students with equitable access to rigorous curriculum. And we keep talking about ensuring they have equitable outcomes as well. And that um, the, we help schools meet the federal and state performance requirements. The first big celebration I have for you today is uh, talking about our food services and the summer meals. Uh, between breakfast and lunch, they serve 98,382 meals at seven sites and with 26 staff members. This is more than double what we served last year. So definitely it was a high need and our food services people de deserve a shout out because they were working hard and making sure that our, our students had what they needed so they could be um, well fed and uh, ready to learn. So in the programs we're gonna talk about for elementary, we'll talk a little bit about Everett Ready, our uh, just the regular elementary summer school and then our extended school year programs. For middle school, we'll talk about the English learner programs. We have math pathways and math bridges. And then at high school, we'll talk about credit recovery, English learner uh, programs, and online high school. So I'm gonna start with the extended school year programs. And those are the programs for our students with disabilities. Uh, we had to get creative this year. They were all run virtually. We had nine students who participated in virtual small group activities five who participated in therapy and a consultation, a, a mixture of that, and two who had tutoring and consultation. And as a reminder, these um, are for students who were worried about uh, regression of skills, um, maybe their skills are still emerging or they need some maintenance help. And we focused on the critical skills of academics, communications, motor skills, adaptive skills, and then social uh, behavioral skills. So that was our extended school year program. Everett Ready was uh, very exciting and we had major changes to our Everett Ready program this year due to the implementation of our transitional kindergarten, uh, which met the needs of those families who had children entering kindergarten in the fall but did not have access to the early learning programs. So for that reason, we had the opportunity to redesign uh, the Everett Ready program and it was open to all incoming kindergartners. They were all invited, including those students um, in Gen Ed and the general education and those students with IEPs. So for the first time, we had all 18 schools who planned a program. Uh, so both Silver Firs and Woodside somewhat modified theirs due to the construction. And uh, we, it was conducted remotely with Zoom sessions for the students and the principals had Zoom sessions with the parents and the teachers did as well. And it was promoted uh, through social media. So what's really is exciting is that we had nearly 800 students who participated in that, this, um, this year. So it was a really big success for us. For the summer school programs, again, uh, we had to do a redesign for the virtual setting. And we were fortunate, uh, Jessica Cornell, before she was appointed principal at Madison was going to be the summer school principal. And she applied some great skills to the instructional design of the course, uh, which uh, incorporated the feedback we had from the parents in the spring. And then when she took the principalship at Madison, Jennifer Reyes and Kelly Bell uh, took over the, as summer school principals. Uh, but this, this program, we had uh, 129 students who were in the English Learner Program K through one. In our second through fourth grade program, we had 477 students who were involved. 155 of those were English learning students. And then we had a separate class for 26 of our um, newcomers who uh, needed more language development. And what's really excited, I, I mentioned that Principal Cornell de developed with parent input the schedule. And so this is an example of what it looks like. And you see the clarity of week by week. You click on the tiles. Um, there was a set schedule uh, for the welcome Zoom. Um, th there was a, a one page shot where kids could get all of their Zoom links and their content right there. So it was very clearly laid out and methodically planned so that the students had everything that they needed um, right there in front of them. For the uh, academic programs, there was common instructional programs in reading, writing, math, science, and the social emotional uh, learning. 
Uh, they had access to iReady that the teachers could facilitate throughout the summer that we used in integrated GLAD strategies, the guided language acquisition design, which is good for all learners. And math really focused on growth mindset and key concepts. And so you see in this image here, it's an example of the type of math problems students engaged in that were very in, um, engaging visually as well. Uh, we're really excited about our student success. The um, attendance, 82% of our students attended all th through the summer. So uh, we'd like it to be 100, but that 82% in the times was a, was a big success for us. They were able to utilize iReady as well. And so we're excited when they take the diagnostic this fall to look at uh, the growth that they've made over the summer. And we had some fantastic feedback uh, from both parents and teachers. I wanted to read a couple of comments from some of our parents. Um, this one parent said, the structure worked very well for my students, having time with the teacher, time to get assignments done and getting back together to discuss what they learned. This gave independence as well as interactions with classmates. Another uh, parent says, said, my child loved the summer school experience and learned a lot during a short period. I like how there was a schedule so I could monitor her learning. Thank you so much. And teachers also raved about having the structure and that really helped them and they were excited about applying what they learned over the summer as they went on into the fall. So that is a brief highlight of our elementary summer school program and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Willard to take us through the middle and high school programs. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster. I'm excited to share. I'm going to share middle school and our high school program, starting with our middle school programs. Our middle school program was composed of three different programs under one big umbrella, our English Learner Program, our Math Pathways Program, and our Math Bridges Program. You can see our students in our English Learner Program over to the left. And then to the right is Sechin Tower, who was our middle school summer program director. And he is also one of our assistant principals at Jackson High School. The first of the three middle school programs is the English Learner Program. So the program served 49 students in grades six through eight. The program similar to the elementary program was five weeks, five weeks long and structured within Canvas in a week by week and day by day template. And you can see it to the right. That was easy for students to follow. Between the synchronous Zoom sessions and the asynchronous learning through programs like Imagine Learning and Literacy, students focused on vocabulary and written English. And the teachers implemented scaffolded instruction, GLAD strategies, and best practices for instructional, um, for our English learners. The next uh, two programs are our middle school math programs. And so both programs were for students in grades six through eight. Teachers and students represented all five of our middle schools and the teachers collabor collaboratively, I can't speak, field tested the open up math materials in a distance learning environment. The Pathways to Success Summer Math Program served 136 students with a focus on addressing gaps in learning, mathematical mindset, and critical thinking. The other part of our math program are the bridges programs, the Bridge to Math 7-8 Compacted and Bridge to 8 Algebra. These two bridges programs serve 69 students and it helped those students accelerate their learning so they would be able to enroll in our 7-8 Compacted Math during the school year or the eighth grade algebra class. We gathered feedback from our summer programs and overwhelmingly it was positive with 96% of our parents sharing that they felt the experience with their, um, with the help for their student would make them more successful during the school year and 94% of parents sharing that their students math, math confidence grew. And then we also gathered some open ended comments and those sentiments shared highlight the same ideas where they felt that their child was more confident about math and there was this option to complete the work at your own pace rather than finishing in a limited amount of time. So now I get to share our high school program. And on this slide to the right, we see Abigail Leslie. She's one of our graduate graduates from our um, 
from our summer programs. And then to the right is Eric Bush, who is our high school summer program director and teacher at Jackson High School. There are three programs in our high school program, credit recovery, our online high school, and our English learner program. So overall, our high school program served 397 individual students. And overall, there were 267 credits earned. What this meant is that there were 534 courses, each worth 0.5 credit completed successfully. The high school program hosted a full menu of courses, including 61 credit recovery options, 24 online high school courses, that's the complete full catalog that we offer, and then we had a new course, Career Experiences, Networks, and Mentorships Internship course, all through our Zoom and online environment, which was um, very engaging and motivating for students. We had four English learner courses, and we had a special education support pro program through our guided study program. The high school summer program enrollment showed similar participation by grade level to previous years with 11th grade showing the greatest enrollment and seniors, because they're already graduated, which is a great thing, showing the smallest enrollment. Then if you look at our, our data by program enrollment, the high school summer program enrollment shows a higher proportion of students this year enrolling in accelerated programs through our online high school program. But the largest proportion of students enrolled in our credit recovery options as they usually do summer after summer. So in the middle of August, we celebrated our seniors again with the summer commencement, and it was held with social distancing measures in place. Our graduation speaker was Zaheus Bustamante, who graduated from our Graduation Alliance Everett program, along with 17 other summer graduates who participated in the ceremony. He said, we can all do great things. We faced many hardships this year, but we all have proven that we can overcome the impossible. And I felt that way too. So as of today, and I hope I'm not totally wrong, every day meant a change, I'm sure, there are 29 summer graduates. So there's always a celebration. So this evening, we had the opportunity to share with you the elementary, middle, and high school programs, serving our students through a wide range of services. In summary, there are many points of pride for the summer program implementation, including the implementation of a learning structure that was clear and engaging, provi providing students with just in time and just right support. Another point of pride was the collaboration and systems teachers implemented to deliver instruction and motivate students in the distance learning environment. And finally, we measured success through strong enrollment and daily attendance and the implementation of instructional best practices. Our next steps for the summer programs are to analyze the long-term impacts of summer school on student achievement and to provide authentic ways for students to interact, especially in our virtual world. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm hoping that your last statement won't be true for long, that we don't need to <laughs> spend yeah. the summer working on virtual world. We learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I'm sure there's some learning that can be applied moving forward as well. That's been yes. the opportunity of this whole thing, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So, directors, do you have any questions for either presenter or student representatives? Director Mitchell. Yeah, I just have a question. Of because I got feedback from a parent um, whose student was in a class over the summer. I don't know if it was credit recovery or to get ahead, but she was a little bit disappointed in the, in her words, lack of workload. And so she really wondered about the standards for a summer school class versus a regular class because she felt like he, her son put very little effort in and still passed the class. So I don't know if that's a, a, a high school student. I don't know if that's an exception. Her, it is her perception or if like just, it's a real question. What kind of standards are there for grading? It was an English class. Again, I don't know what level English, what class, because it was just her concern. So we have, we use our online high school program 
which is standards based and are the classes that we teach during the school year too, very rigorous classes. Um, we also use our fuel ed courses for our credit recovery options, which are aligned to the common core as well. And there are also additional options that teachers provide. So without a lot of details, it would be hard for me to say because we do offer, we had a full catalog this summer and teachers do have options about what they teach, but all of it is standards based. And that's what I wanted to confirm. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. Do other directors have questions or comments or student representatives? Um, I've got a, or I've got a comment, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, I just want to say thank you. I had a daughter in, uh, in summer school this year and she was a incoming ninth grader who just wanted to get ahead. Um, and she really, enjoyed it. Um, the thing that she enjoyed about it or that I knew about it was that it was very similar to what her older sister had taken. Um, so it seemed rather seamless, I guess if that's the best way she did um, health and PE. Her sister was able to actually help her navigate some of that because it was very um, similar to what she had had in the traditional format two years earlier. So as a parent that was really nice. Um, lots and lots of communication from the teacher. Um, it was just an overall really positive experience. So I just wanted to give you that feedback, but I, I think Director Mitchell does have a point um, about the rigor. And I, what I saw with that particular course was that the rigor was what she made of it. So she really wanted to get that A. Um, and so she made it very rigorous, whereas I could see some other people not doing it as much because it's summer school and you know we don't need to worry about it. But for her, um, you know, her, she has like a, a three, eight, nine, six, four. I mean, they go down to like the nth decimal point because they're super competitive. So she didn't want to mess it up, but so she made it super rigorous. And I like that the course allowed for that. So um, yeah, kudos to the team working the summer because it was a really good experience. Thank you. And Director Lassane, did you have a comment that you liked or a question? Yes, I do. Um, for um, Dr. Willard, one of the questions that I have has to do with middle school. And I see that we offered English language um, for English learners. And we also offered three different types of math programs, math, uh, pathways, and bridge math. Did we offer any um, language arts for those that were not English learners? Did we offer any kind of um, program other than just math for non for regular you know English speakers? We we did not. We've we've had in place. We continue the programs that we've had in place. Uh, where we were moving students forward. So those were in the English learner and the math programs that you described. Fantastic. I'm glad that we did offer those math classes. Now the math classes for grade six through eighth were just uh, to keep them on track for their, where they were, they were at for math during the summer. Is that correct? Well, there were two kinds of, of math programs. One was to fill in any gaps and make sure that students were entering this fall at grade level, right? So high support. Then we also had an accelerated track. So those were the bridges programs so that students were ready to basically enter a higher level of math when they came in in the fall. I see. Thank you very much for that. You're welcome. And, and for high school, other than the, the summer graduates, I see we had a very large class when you think of it, 397 students taking high school classes. That's amazing. That's yes, really was. outstanding. I'm very happy about that. You know, that's quite a few students there, you know. Um, have we ever had such a large class like that before? Uh, we, we usually, ha the thing is, is this wasn't so different than what we usually have, which was a really positive piece going into the summer is that students and families did sign up. What we saw is that because we had options for grades this spring, that credit recovery was not the largest, I mean, it was the largest part of the pie, but what we saw is that kids wanted to accelerate in online high school. And so we saw more students showing up for those classes. So uh, the pie can, shifted a little bit. Can you give us any kind of idea of how many of those students requested some support as far as um, um, 
support in the way of paying for their their tuition. Uh, are we seeing more and more students requesting tuition assistance than before, or is this about average? It was similar to the past, and we're very fortunate that the foundation, Everett Public Schools Foundation, provides scholarships for our students who either qualify for free and reduced lunch, but they actually opened it up beyond that that students just showed need. So that was, that was a turning point for us as well. We were able to offer those scholarships and students certainly took us up in it. At this point, it would be hard for me to tell that it was really different than previous years, um, but it was very much similar in terms of the numbers of students who access those, um, uh, those scholarships. But middle school is not by tuition, just high That's school right. is by tuition? Yeah, middle school it is no cost to the student. Our credit recovery program is no cost to the student. So the only program that would provide scholarships that we have scholarships for are our online high school program. Uh, I just wanted to know if we were, I, I know this is just out there and we, we probably had no way of identifying those students or identifying if this is the case, but at some point in the future, uh, with online um, classes being offered, at what point will online accelerated classes be um, no charge for students so that they can continue to get some benefit of accelerated learning? I don't know the answer to that. We've historically charged for that, but that's certainly something we can consider going forward. Because it seems like right now we've proven that we can do it. We've had online uh, through the semester just to engage more and more students so they can continue to have that positive opportunities in schools and can see it as a benefit versus um, recovery or something that I have to do. Uh, continuous learning is very important and when there's no charge and you still are, are um, you know, allowing students to take advantage of that and to be ahead and to learn more and more without a charge to their parents, I think more and more students will come in and say they were interested in doing that, taking advantage of that opportunity. So just to find out, I just would like to know, how is it growing? Is it growing with more and more kids looking for scholarships because they can't afford it? Or just the fact that it's growing and we need to start considering the possibilities of there being no charge for that, but allowing students to continue to learn in this fashion. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Good work. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just uh, echo the director listens and so people know when you talk about charge and no charge, two classes we took was over $600. So these aren't cheap. Like it's not like, oh, 50 bucks versus 100 bucks. This is, you know, 300 plus dollars per class, per half credit class. So yeah, 325. It's a, yeah, 325. So it's a significant cost. And I know a lot of parents, there's a lot of folks can't afford a lot of folks can't and there's a lot in the middle that probably don't want to ask for that scholarship um, because that was seen a certain kind of way so I think there are families that probably take advantage of the accelerated learning um, and for our family it was because we want to take an extra load, right so that's again privilege uh, that a lot of kiddos won't have if they don't have you know well over six hundred dollars can I just clarify based on this discussion, summer school is not supported by the state. Is that correct? That's correct. And so that's where we have to self fund it. So it either have to come from the foundation, voters for levy dollars into our general fund that we would make a decision that's, that's how we wanted to do it. The other thing is that um, one summer school is only that half of a year if we do it through the Everett Public Schools. But if you do it at a community college at that same rate, it's a full year over the summer. And yeah. so that was something we learned um, for Becca that she had to do a miss a couple, like she wanted to get ahead and also take make up a class doing a Cascadia was the same price as Everett, but she got a full year's worth of class over the summer versus the half a year of a class over the summer. 
Um, so there are different decisions parents have to make. And also we have to make as a district about where do we want to fund since the state does not fund summer school. So thank you. What happens to students in middle school if they opt into a high school classroom uh, to take a class? Uh, I mean, I know we may not be charging it now, but if we were to um, have an algebra class or a geometry class in uh, middle school for certain students that are, are able to take those classes, would they still have to incur the additional costs? Right now we do have, we've had a growing number over the last few years of middle school students who enroll in algebra or geometry, some even ahead of that. It's amazing what students can do. They do pay for the tuition, so that is part of it as well. If they're taking the high school accelerated classes through online high school. And the other thing is counseling, right? So it depends on the counselors are pushing it. And so I know for Heatherwood, these kids it was all Heatherwood kids basically in, in the class that my daughter took because the counselors are telling them very frankly, you know, you want to get ahead, you accelerated, you can afford it, so do it. And so I don't know if that message is being heard at all of our schools, um, but as a result, these kids kind of have a leg up in terms of what they can do in high school and more options because they've got this year's worth of credit out of the way. Thank you for that. I, this has been a really rich conversation um, given parent input in particular. I really appreciate um, the clarification around all of this. I was gonna check and see if student representatives or Director Nichols was interested in question or a comment. Go ahead, Tara. Um, yeah, so I actually took uh, an online health class over the summer. Um, the, again, just to, to get ahead a little bit because I didn't take PE and health my freshman year. Um, and I, I just want to echo what has been said about um, it kind of holding back certain students. I know for my family, um, a scholarship or a voucher isn't uh, something that we can we would consider because um, that's the kind of opportunity that is for um, students with less privilege. And I come from a family with a lot of privilege. Um, and so that's not something that we would um, consider when applying for uh, summer school, but then $325 is a lot of money no matter what family you come from. Um, and so you're seeing something like a scholarship and the automatic assumption is for, is that this is for um, someone from a family that has less privilege um, to benefit that student. And so um, I guess just echoing what's been said about um, that charge existing, even for families that can afford it, a lot of the times it's a question of do they want to afford it or should they afford it? Um, is it worth it for that student? Um, so I, I, just, I, would, I just wanted to echo that from a student's perspective um, because I, I did take the online health class this summer. I have Great. to say it's, it's uh, pretty wild to me because uh, growing up for me yeah, in a small town in Arizona, I never paid for summer school. So this whole concept to me is, is a little bit mind blowing. Granted, it's been like 20 years or something since, since I was in high school. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, but this, this concept that the state legislature isn't uh, supporting year long learning uh, is a little shocking to me for lack of a better word. But I'm glad that we have options like the foundation and hopefully sometime in the future we can find resources to make this more accessible to more people. And could I, could I ask, um, because it wasn't really a part of the presentation for either um, Dr. Lancaster or Willard to clarify what gets charged for and what doesn't? Are you asking which, which courses have tuition? Yes. The only, the only piece where there's tuition is online high school for high school students. And those are accelerated classes. Otherwise, yeah. there is no charge to students. And for elementary, it's all funded through Title um, I or the foundation. So there are, are no charge for the elementary programs. Mm -hmm. So no charge for elementary, no charge for middle school, unless a few individuals are taking online high school classes. Correct. Okay. And, and the other online uh, credit recovery is not a charge either. 
That's correct. So, okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure ev all everyone understood what was being charged for because there is some, there's quite a bit actually of uncharged summer school. <laughs> okay. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Thank you both very much for the detailed overview and to the directors and student representatives for your good questions and comments. We are going to now move on to our information and discussion item, which um, tonight, and I think in every future meeting for the immediate future, is going to be a COVID-19 fall 2020 reopening status. <laughs> Should have put my glasses on, thank you. <laughs> Um, good evening. So I will be starting us off tonight and we're excited to share with you all the plans that are being implemented as of first thing tomorrow morning. A couple of things that we want to cover is just some of the school kickoff highlights. We're going to have an academic update, a health and safety update, a fiscal update, and then a parent engagement update. And this information was in the Friday report last week, but or two weeks ago, I guess, but we just want to let you know that there were a lot of different plans implemented by all the different schools and the way that they chose to welcome back their students. There have been some drive-by parades. There have been um, different, different pickup events that you mentioned already in tonight's meeting. Um, all the different schools um, did their own unique um, way of welcoming back their students. Here you can see a map of one of the parade routes that um, the administrators took driving through the student neighborhoods so they could um, try to see all the um, students that they were welcoming back since we couldn't have all the students into the building. And then as many of you mentioned tonight too, we have this theme adventure together and I'm not going to play the video, but I hope that you were able to see Dr. Saltzman on the ropes course challenging his um, his courage a little bit out there to say that we can all accomplish great things when we work together and that video is on our website if you'd like to see that. So we've had some district welcome but also a lot of just individual welcomes from the schools for the year. Thanks Kathy. I'd like to start with the um, talking about attendance here and a few beliefs about the importance of attendance. So we, we believe uh, that attendance is a critical building block of student learning. And um, it's a kind of an intuitive idea that if students aren't present, they can't fully engage in learning. Uh, attendance is a leading indicator of equity that signals when students might need additional support and, and um, sets in motion that support at the school-based level, at the district level. Um, so we've got system improvement uh, and school improvement um, uh, um, focus areas based on our monitoring of attendance. It's also, as you know, the primary criteria that drives state funding and district staffing. So OSPI has defined an absence uh, during COVID for this particular uh, year, this launching the 2021 school year, as a student not participating in planned instructional activities on a scheduled remote learning day. So evidence of student participation, so this is the positive to that, kind of the, the inverse to that um, definition. Uh, evidence of the student participation in remote learning may include, but is not limited to daily logins to learning management systems, so in our case, Canvas, or daily interaction with the teacher, or evidence of participation in a task and assignment. So, um, think about it in terms of student participation can be synchronous or asynchronous. So live real-time instruction for synchronous and asynchronous could be um, a more directed independent learning set into motion by the teacher. And we want to capture student participation within a 24-hour period to qualify as being present that day. So for example, a student can participate synchronously or asynchronously from the beginning of a school day to the beginning of the next school day to qualify as being present. And so we believe allowing uh, students that 24 hour period of time to participate best matches the intent of asynchronous learning uh, and providing them the maximum flexibility allowed for in this definition uh, to students and families to demonstrate participation uh, in the ways that they can. 
and, and, and that we would encourage and that we would remove any and all obstacles that we can to that participation. There's also language in the Washington Administrative Code that outlines what schools must do to track attendance. Uh, we need at, at the school level to monitor daily attendance data, which we have done um, for, for many, many years. That's, that is not a new practice. Having a process to contact families and log multiple attempts in parents' home language, it's not a new practice, but we need to make sure that that's happening consistently. Um, and providing daily notification of absences, which again is not a new practice, but again, to meld, um, to make sure that those systems are aligned. Uh, the, clearly the spirit here is to uh, monitor and, um, and intervene early and often with students who are not um, participating and, and diagnosing what those obstacles are and removing them. Uh, this new language is intended, to, not there quite yet, Kathy, thanks. The, the new language is intended to strengthen the efforts of schools and district, again, to, to proactively respond to student absences in a timely and supportive manner. Um, just a, 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 um, uh, as a, as a interesting footnote, there, there were additional reasons absences can be excused due to COVID and those, those definitions have been expanded a bit. For example, mm -hmm. uh, students needing to care for an ill family member, um, parents' work schedule or family obligations. I think I'm handing this over to Dr. Bowden. Awesome, thank you. So this fall, we developed student schedules to help provide a more robust experience for all of our students. We listened to our families and students this summer about their spring experience, and we've responded to our families who are asking for a more robust experience. So we worked collaboratively with our teacher partners to thoughtfully develop structured schedules that have some elasticity so that we can respond to the needs of our students and our families. You see here, this is the elementary school model schedules. There's both an early start and a late start. And our elementary schedules reflect some of those changes with synchronous contact each and every day with morning check-ins, morning meetings, as well as a large window prior to lunch for content learning zones. It's about two and a half hours. It also includes another learning zone after lunch where teachers can do both real-time synchronous learning as well as asynchronous learning opportunities or directed independent learning for our students. Our middle school model is um, a little bit different. It, with our middle school schedules, we have schedules with four periods a day. You'll see on day A, we have one, three, five, and seven, and two, four, six, and an advisory period um, for a combination of directed independent learning time and a session that's dedicated to social emotional learning. Each period in the middle school session is uh, 75 minutes, or one hour and 15 minutes, which provides time for a combination again, of both asynchronous and small group student support, as well as asynchronous instruction. So we know that our families have asked for um, direct contact with kids each and every day and every period, and our, our, our teachers are responding with our middle school schedule. I would like to actually call out that in response to family and student needs, while we've included a specific block of time for a second step lesson in the middle school schedule, we also have established with our teaching staff that social emotional learning is not a standalone. It needs to be embedded within each of the periods and in instruction each day. Our kids need to have that touch point, that communication with our, with our teachers and our staff um, to check in, see how they're doing. We know that remote learning is not easy for everyone and we wanna make sure that that takes a priority. In high school, the schedule is similar to the middle school schedules with a one, two, three period A day and a four, five, six period B day with a periods of about 105 minutes. Again, this provides time for students to engage every day with their teacher synchronously, but also has built in time for each period for additional time and support for small group student support, as well as the asynchronous activities. With all of our schedules, we really wanted to respond to our students and families who are asking for that more robust programming with regular daily contact with each teacher for our students. Um, I know that our teachers are really excited to get going next year or this tomorrow um, and making sure that they're connecting with their students as much as they possibly can. Um, next slide, Kathy. To help facilitate that, as we shift into this new year, we recognize that the first part of the weeks, uh, the first weeks of school in real life 
is always about building relationships and developing those student and family connections. Because this was so important, we elected to begin the first days of school with time allocated specifically for the purpose of building those relationships. So in elementary schools, we've designated the first five days as conference days to connect with students and families to prepare and set us up for success in the distance learning programs. So students will have a combination of both real-time instruction and asynchronous instruction all the way through lunch. And then after lunch, students will engage in directed independent learning while teachers meet to work, meet with parents and confer with students in conferences. At the secondary level, the first three days are two and a half hour early release days where students will run on a shortened schedule going to each period for an abbreviated amount of time. And in the release time, teachers are using this time to meet with families and students to plan for how they can support a smooth implementation of their students distance learning program. These activities could look like virtual parent meetings, whole group meet and greet, virtually, of course, and scheduled one-on-ones with parents and or students. Um, and as I've shared, we know that we did the very best that we could in the spring, but we recognize we had very little time to plan for a closure, which made the implementation of distance learning a challenge for us. So we knew that this fall, for us to be successful, we needed to do better. And so our staff education plan was very intentional around de developing a distance learning plan that can help our teachers and our staff to support the learning of all of our students. So this fall, we intentionally educated our staff in four key areas. Best instructional practices in remote learning. Um, we provided distance learning playbook, which is a publication teaching guide that helps to provide teaching strategies for both engagement and impact in a remote setting. We focused on equitable outcomes and our professional development opportunities. We're fostering inclusion and belonging in schools in a culturally responsive way. We focused on social emotional learning training, which is where we wanted to help our staff learn how to embed those social emotional learning opportunities into all content areas to best meet the needs of our students in a virtual environment. And finally, the big one, learning management systems, our single platform canvas was in response to the feedback that we got from families in the spring where they asked for a single platform to access student um, remote learning environment. We are using Canvas, so for us to establish a really strong and successful start, we focused several learning opportunities in building virtual classrooms in Canvas so teachers can teach virtually with confidence. So we're excited to see what, that what's going to start tomorrow is going to be an amazing remote learning session, and we've done uh, some really thoughtful and intentional planning to help set our students and our staff up for success. And I think I'm turning this back over to Peter. Actually, it's to uh, Brian Beckley. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. So the uh, the Learning and Information Technology Services team has been working to create uh, a sustainable and fully supported digital environment. You've heard uh, both Dr. Bolton and uh, Dr. Scott reference Canvas as our our primary uh, hub. Uh, pictured on this slide, you'll see the virtual learning, and I, I have mentioned this uh, uh, previous, but it is really our focus uh, in throughout the summer of the launch of our Key Forward to focus our professional learning in these areas of creation, collaboration, synchronous, asynchronous engagement. And throughout the summer, uh, our team has been uh, working to support teachers in, in learning about uh, these components in each of these. The biggest, of course, as Dr. Bowden just mentioned, is the virtual classroom, which is Canvas. Uh, one of the clear messages we heard was a single platform, streamlined information, central location, place to start uh, to serve as the hub uh, for digital tools, calendar, messaging, that sort of thing. So the training opportunities uh, to support staff in learning about Canvas started in August with teachers in a differentiated approach with courses ranging based on where they were at in their, their knowledge and, and work with Canvas from Canvas basics to working and where they worked on uh, creating a homepage and use of Canvas templates, learning about Canvas itself. Uh, we differentiated between elementary and secondary for those courses as well, uh, up to more advanced courses, which was the use of Canvas Studio, which is the media tool that allows students and instructors to upload, create, edit, share, discuss audio and video files. 
Um, and the sessions we uh, also had were on supporting teachers for strategies on how they could effect effectively design synchronous engagement opportunities for their students. Uh, we also coordinate with school leadership teams on building-based live sessions to uh, engage the leadership teams in each of the buildings uh, to then be able to best support their, their teaching staff as well. So the format, uh, because this was all done remotely, was uh, supplemented with asynchronous modules that we had that teachers could use uh, on demand as needed, but we also included live sessions. We included drop-in times for teachers to connect for more personalized coaching opportunities. And then we also had sessions uh, in both of the LID days in uh, early September to provide training sessions for teachers. When the decision um, to begin the year fully remote was made, we adjusted our device collection plans accordingly. Uh, so instead of collecting devices back and then having parents come back and, and check them out again a couple of weeks later, we adjusted and we only collected them from students leaving a particular school site. So during the week of August 10th, our fifth grade students who were leaving to go to middle school turned theirs in. And uh, the same went for eighth graders as they were getting ready to leave for high school. Uh, the difference was at North and Gateway because those are our uh, last two middle schools to go one-to-one. -one, so all of their students turned their devices in because all of their students got a different Chromebook here uh, at the end of August. So that was the one, the one difference. Um, the beginning the week of August 24th, uh, school sites then began to have their checkouts at the high school, at the middle school um, for both computers and for hotspots. And the key was we really wanted to work with the schools based on their schedule of how, what worked for them and their families. And then our team was uh, supplementing and we sort of fit into the schedule where, where schools wanted us uh, to be. And uh, our hotspots provided for, for students that didn't have internet. And because we we're fully one-to-one -one this year, we were able to do one computer for each student, not for, for each family. So the numbers you see reflected here are as of last Wednesday afternoon, they're, they're higher than that now, but that was, you know, they, they've been ongoing every day. In fact, there were several events even today uh, of more deployment. So lot, lots going on meeting the needs to get everyone the, the things they need to be able to connect tomorrow morning uh, to go into their virtual classroom to learn. Thanks, Brian. So as you've heard before, we use a tiered approach to supporting students' social emotional learning, uh, which is an incredibly important anchor for, for their learning or a prerequisite to that learning. Uh, all, all of our students K-12 will receive universal supports built into their courses across the content areas. Dr. Broughton spoke to that a bit. We're beginning training in the ruler framework across all grade levels to enhance social emotional learning supports that have historically and largely been built up in, in grades K through eight. So the ruler uh, framework is, it comes from the Yale Center for Emotional Development. It's an acronym standing for recognizing, understanding, labeling, expressing, and regulating emotions. And the framework involves PD or professional development for adults to best support students in their classrooms across all content areas. We've got 1300 teachers and we think that economy of scale in terms of their reach and the touch points that they have with their students in the instructional core, it's, it's, it's critical that they incorporate these tenets of the ruler framework um, within, within the content areas. You're also most likely uh, familiar with our second step curricular resources in grades K through eight. So in elementary, some of the units of study uh, focus on learning, empathy, emotion management, and problem solving. And at the middle level, it, uh, units focus on mindsets, friendships, thoughts, and emotions, making good decisions, and navigating peer conflicts. So those are universal supports K-12 um, in tier one. Tier two approaches are applied for students who need additional support beyond tier one. And then beyond that, some students may need more intensive supports that are, are specific to their individual circumstances that might be delivered over an extended period of time using specialist uh, service providers, and we call those tier three supports. Uh, later this month, we're excited to uh, implement our panorama uh, social emotional learning survey, our window 
uh, will be given in grades three through 12 uh, in September, starting September 21 through October 9. And these measures uh, uh, on this survey measure the, the following indicators. So we uh, have sense of belonging indicators, grit, growth mindset, safety, social awareness, self-efficacy, self-management, and teacher-student relationships. And uh, a tool that we've had for the last two years is called the Student Success Platform, also from Panorama. And it allows for those social emotional learning indicators that, that, um, that are derived from that, that survey to be cross-referenced with, with uh, indicators that are critical like attendance, grades, and discipline so that we can see sort of red flag or flag um, uh, certain, um, uh, certain indicators that would uh, demonstrate that there might be a deeper challenge or issue or problem and then mobilize staff accordingly on any number of those, um, on those indicators, whether that's discipline, grades, attendance, or social emotional learning indicators. So we look forward to sharing more about um, our social emotional learning supports at an October 13th board meeting as well in more detail. So health and safety training here district-wide. So um, this, this includes all of our work sites. Um, not just, it just doesn't exclusively pertain to our buildings, though we are uh, very much um, uh, paying attention to accessibility and safety and health in, in our school buildings, um, uh, as well as every building across the organization. Uh, they're designed to comply with the guidance of all applicable public health agencies, including our State Department of Health and local health district. And prior to staff returning to district work sites, all employees are provided with a health and safety training on protocols and procedures that are, are both district wide and specific to their building. Uh, we talk about face coverings, uh, the district's providing adequate face coverings to all staff who report to campuses or buildings. So if you've been to the CRC, you know that um, we offer them there and we've got signage that would make it very clear that um, wearing your mask is mandatory if they don't bring their own personal face coverings from home. Uh, daily screening and attestation. Um, this is a new word in our vocabulary, attestation that, that, that we've been introduced to. The idea that prior to entering any district facility, uh, stakeholders need to self attest to their health and temperature. And so we do that um, coming to our workplaces. Folks that, that visit um, school buildings do the same. There are no touch thermometers at these um, kiosks, or the, really their, their desks with, with the equipment that we need to have folks attest um, that they are healthy and that they don't have a uh, temperature uh, and of over 100, I think it's 100.4. Um, and again, those thermometers are there um, as needed. Um, Physical distancing. Each building has been equipped with physical distancing signage to adhere to best practices. We have an increased supply of hand sanitizers in our buildings, both water, not water bottles, they're, 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 they're sanitizer, uh, hand sanitizer bottles. They're wall mounts is what I was getting at. Um, wall mounted hand sanitizer stations. Those were delivered and installed in key public area buildings earlier this summer. Wall-mounted hand sanitizers were installed in all portable classrooms. Uh, so for teachers choosing to teach from their classrooms, hand sanitizer pump bottles were delivered. Uh, frequent hand washing continues to be emphasized as well, just as best practice. And so in addition to these attestation areas where folks need to sign uh, to attest um, to their health at, uh, prior to entering uh, any district building, uh, I mentioned increased signage in, front, in the front office and supports for parents um, or others visiting for um, official school business reasons. And um, within the uh, front office areas, increased uh, barriers like plexiglass barriers have been installed uh, in, in those office areas um, in order for staff to interact safely with visitors. I think I'm turning this over to Jeff Moore. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I can tell you that our, given the circumstances, our food services team is pretty excited. I think uh, Dr. Willard shared the great news uh, from the summer program. Um, but this program, just like many others, uh, 
we, we did some outreach to our community, to our customers and ask them, what can we do better? And clearly making them accessible was one of the keys. So I think in the August 20th Friday report, I sent you um, a, a breakdown of what's going on, but we have expanded from seven to 13 school sites. And we have just not at lunchtime, we have morning and noon locations trying to meet the needs of our of our citizens. We also went, as other districts did in the spring, to a five-day meal kit. And it has perishable items, so they're, they know well that they should take them home and get them um, refrigerated. But that particular program today, as of, we have 1,784 pre-orders. So people go online and order their, their meal kit. And if you realize back in the spring, we were really hitting around 1,300 or 1,500. It's pretty exciting that more of our community is being served by this federal extension. Um, as I mentioned, we are also taking it to five high density apartment complexes. And again, working with um, our, our team upstairs with our students of need to make sure we identify them and that we can provide them home deliveries on a daily basis. They may not have the uh, ability to store that much food. So we're pretty pleased and looking forward to that program expanding to more of our community. Next slide, please. Um, the fiscal outlook, I, I think in the, again, in the August 28th, or actually the August school board meeting, you saw the July financial report. Um, we know that the tailwind of the savings from the spring um, is providing us additional resources. We're up from 10% to 10.3%. And even since then, about uh, 875,000 higher going into this. Um, we also know that um, some of the savings that we realized in the spring, uh, although we're hitting the ground in a different way and more aggressively, should carry forward while we're in 100% remote learning. We've also uh, been cognizant of this enrollment drop and particularly in elementary work collectively with the administration to see and hold on to some vacant positions in terms of teachers so we're not overstaffed uh, for the year. Equally, you know that we've done some classified furloughs and they're estimated to save 620,000 a month. And that is um, conservative because we're, we're in a situation where unemployment costs are unprecedented and we are part of the uh, Northwest ESD uh, Unemployment Cooperative Pool and we know that there's going to be some ongoing costs related to that. Nevertheless, 620000 is very helpful. Um, we know that we might have an assessment of $1.5 million, and I think it's more or less been affirmed in the next couple of weeks. And so we're building those costs into the savings and, and showing you a net of what we think is about 620000 a month. The transportation formula, also a briefing on that. Um, it's a wait and see how we respond. Do they do count days in the fall and in January? And when you miss the student counts, then your revenues decline. Right now, um, we estimate that if we don't return to full busing and have those student counts, we need to rely upon the legislature to understand that we still have ongoing costs, as I mentioned, associated with furloughs and staffing and equipment. Um, I believe that they are aware of that, and I've heard from one of our local senators that it's likely to come up early in the session so that they can mitigate the concerns of school districts. So certainly on our legislative platform. And just remember, while we're probably buffered for three or 400, each additional 100 student enrollment loss is about 1.4 million in funding. So we also know the legislature has difficult work to do this session. Um, our big unknown, and excuse me, there's a truck driving by right now, our big unknown is enrollment counts. And it's not like in the past where you can see clear indicators. Uh, the work that Dr. Scott mentioned to be intentional and thoughtful about identifying each student, um, we're gonna, I'm, I believe we're gonna be successful, but it's gonna take a little longer to know um, exactly where we are, probably early next week. Um, we also don't know when we're gonna go back to full occupancy. So there's a lot of unknowns looking forward, but. Um, as we walk through time with you, we will keep you informed on our fiscal position. Thank you. Well, you've heard many times tonight that many of the decisions that we made for this fall were based on feedback we got from our community. 
And another piece that we heard is that we needed to provide better resources and supports for our parents. So as we committed on September 2nd, we launched Parent University on our website. And um, even since then, I think we've added eight or nine more resources since then. So it's not a stagnant resource, but something we're going to be continuing to add to. And I can tell you that, so it's been up less than a week. Um, we have had 4,800 people visit it and we've, they've gone to 6,700 different times. So um, we've had some really good traffic there and we're gonna continue to add information as we get feedback from parents on what they're missing. We'll make a resource for that and add it on and it, we'll just continue to see that page grow throughout the year. Dr. Scott. So thank you. We really appreciate the opportunity to communicate the, this fall reopening status on this uh, first day of school eve. And uh, we, we, we're operating, it as we've mentioned several times, uh, in a spirit of continuous improvement, responding to feedback. We are truly stronger together. We're so excited to launch and greet students tomorrow. It's the best day of the year. Uh, we look forward to these monthly updates as well to monitor progress in, in, in these areas. So in, in, at, this time, at this time, we uh, welcome your questions uh, or comments. Thank you everyone for um, a really robust presentation, a lot of really great information there for directors to absorb and understand as we head into tomorrow. Directors and student representatives, do you have questions regarding information that was presented? Director Mitchell. Yes, um, I just want to thank everyone for this presentation. And um, I just have two questions. Um, I don't know if Mike Gunn is on the on the call or somebody else. Um, because of the air quality right now, you know, the, the, their service suggesting to turn off air conditioners and HVAC so you're not bringing in all the smoke. So with our staff in the buildings, how are we keeping staff safe from that air quality? Um, or turning off HVAC because then if anybody might be positive with COVID, then it's sitting in the air instead of the air exchangers requirements that happen with COVID. So I know it's a very specific question given the certain, the special circumstances of the smoke. I have a second question, but if anybody even could even try to answer that, or if that's something we need to get back to me or back to everybody on, I think I just wanna make sure everybody's safe in buildings that need to be secured because of the smoke or sealed because of the smoke. So um, I am on the, the board meeting. This is Mike Gunn. Uh -huh. um, and our HVAC systems are continuing to run. We've made sure that they're all um, operating as designed. And we also have filters on our HVAC, HVAC systems that we replace three times a year, including in the summer. And these help filter out some of the particulates from the outside air coming in. Um, and we are also encouraging staff to not open windows at this time. Okay, so perfect. we're, so yeah. that's it. Yeah, thank you. Cause my home AC, my home furnace, I could smell the smoke with the furnace fan running. So I just shut everything off and that smoke's gone. <laughs> so I'm just not bringing any outside air. So my second question, for tomorrow, just based on what I heard in the news on Seattle um, and any other schools, um, do parents and students are, 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 is the website for every school pretty much set up for if you cannot connect, here's who you call, this is what you do, if there's any internet problems, how are we going to be connecting with families tomorrow? These are just extraordinary times and I would not like us to be in the news unless it's positive. Do you, do you want me to take that one, uh, Peter? Yes. Um, yeah, so it, the, the resource that we have out there is the, it would, would be to call our, our help desk to be, to, that's the, the resource we have for parents to call that, that number. But we're gonna be monitoring this proactively in terms of the ability to monitor the network traffic to see what's happening. Um, communicating proactively with Canvas early on in the day about any uh, issues, same with Google. Uh, those, were, those were some of the things, um, some, of, some of them, you know, we, we can make some adjustments early on and, and we are gonna be monitoring it so parents aren't gonna sort of be left in, in 
the, the lurch of being able to connect. But there might be certain situations where a parent has difficulty and they, they're directed to call our help desk line. So we're, we're fully staffed uh, with both our LMS team and our, our help desk team to be able to field those calls. Okay, great. Thank you. So our third, just third question, because you had some outstanding college students at Jackson High School that I think are working with LMS and with the deployment of the machines. Um, a lot of them um, aren't going back to school for another week. So do you still have that much of all those college students available that are sort of going to be manning phones and manning computers? They were outstanding. Yes, we are utilizing them as long as we possibly can. Uh, we, we lost several of them over the last couple of weeks, but uh, we, we've even had some that uh, have traveled back to us from Bellingham on days they're not uh, in classes to continue to help us. So yeah, as long as we, as we can, uh, we'll Outstanding. continue. Outstanding. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, been a great, that's been a great crew. Yeah, it was fun to talk to them about which high school they graduated from, what college, and they're like, yeah, school doesn't start for a week, so I'm here, and God, they were Johnny on the spot. So thank you. Director Nichols, I know you had a question. Yeah, so again, for, for Brian, um, I, I know there's a lot of uh, hiccups when you're rolling out a system this large and, and things like that. So um, I, had, I had seen some, some input, some fr frustration from some of the parents that they were having problems with either logging on in general um, or logging on and finding that their students' um, schedules weren't accessible to them, especially if they had multiple students. Has that been a, a big problem for you folks, or is this kind of just like a onesie twosie hiccup that's going on? Yeah, the, the schedules being uh, visible today has been, is, is a big deal, wanting to make sure that they, that students can log in today. And so we've been, we've been addressing those as one ops previous to today. We had some parents that wanted to be able to log in and see their student's schedule. And then when they couldn't see their schedule, there was some frustration there. But uh, when we heard from parents today, if there was some, uh, some access uh, questions, those were, those were sort of one-offs that we wanted to, to address uh, because we wanted parents to be able to go through today to be able to sort of like do a dry run uh, and to be able to, um, to, be able to do that. But the one piece is that Canvas with parent access, it starts tomorrow at midnight. Mm -hmm. uh, or tonight at midnight. So sometimes parents couldn't see it, but the students could. Uh, okay. But tomorrow that should all, and, and we, we went in and adjusted that time when we realized that it happened. And uh, how, how long, what's our turnaround time for replying to people calling the help desk, leaving a message? What's our kind of average response time for that? Well, that the average response time, it's, it kind of, it, I'd have to get, I don't have like a particular time, but we wanted sure. to replicate those within the day. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't always make that. We work throughout the weekend. So sometimes we, we got to them. Um, we had some parents on Thursday and Friday and we, they might not have heard us from us until uh, later on, but uh, we, we like to keep those within the day, uh, okay. but certainly to have them resolved uh, before the first day of school. So we'll be, we'll be, we're working on it even currently. Fantastic. And my last question for you is I know when I was helping hand out Chromebooks, thank you very much for facilitating that for me, by the way, um, that we were on wait lists for hotspots. Have we caught up to those wait lists or are we still waiting on more to come in? No, we, we have. That's why in, in that slide, what I showed how many hotspots between Wednesday and today, we probably distributed another thousand to 1250 hotspots. Um, so we, we, uh, we got our shipment from T-Mobile sort of early in the week, but we were able to turn that around and, and get, through, um, get through the schools. And we'll continue to, you know, we've got our next, we're sort of always anticipating the next flux, but yes, we got that. We've gotten through the wait list at this point. Awesome, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Directors, other directors or student representatives, any can I, may, may I ask a couple questions, if I may? Um, I noticed we were talking about student meals. As far as uh, kit students, how are we um, how are we reaching out to the kit students in order to ensure that they have their meals available to them? In the same way we did in the spring, Director. Um, 
Dr. Golden's team has, has relationships with all of those individuals and they're coordinating and doing a specific outreach. It's not waiting for them to talk to us. We're reaching out and talking to them. And that's the partnership that worked well in the spring. So it, it's very progressive and, and um, we're trying to help those families certainly. Okay, and I noticed in, in the Friday report, they had an, a section on the kit housing. Uh, my concern for those kit students are uh, also hot spots. Um, Brian, are you assisting um, with the kit students for hot spots necessary for them as well? Yes, yeah, I've, I've been working with them on those, that need as well. Okay. And we still have the housing program still going on for those students that may need housing. I know um, Dr. Jones was working on that before she retired, but my concern is in this, in this era of pandemic, COVID-19, are we, do we have someone um, focused in on ensuring that they have the housing that they need available if they can get them? I can go ahead and step in on that one. Uh, Dr. Chad Golden is overseeing some of those pieces with the McKinney-Vento and Kids in Transition with housing. So we can give an update on where we're at with that in the Friday report. Okay, thank you very much. My next question, uh, Dr. Bolton, we have, and I see here now we have Lift Fridays that changed from Lift Wednesdays. Was there an an element of concern necessary? Was it parental concerns? What for we, that change? Thank you. Uh, we actually, when we decided, um, when we, initially when we were looking at the hybrid model, we were looking at a Wednesday off for cleaning. And we had just, we had asked to make a change from Lift Fridays to Lift to make it a learning improvement Wednesday. Um, and in fact, what we did is we went back to the Fridays because that was a known entity. It was easier for transitions. We had schedules built. So we decided to, um, for continuity's sake, stay with learning improvement Fridays for that time being. Okay, I appreciate that. And that information has gotten out to families so that they are aware it's Lip Fridays versus Lip Wednesdays, correct? That's, that is correct. Thank you so much. Those are all the questions I have, uh, Director Mason. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments, concerns? I'm good. Thank you for uh, that great report and all the directors literally every question on this. So I'm kind of <laughs> amused. Thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all to the presenters and for pulling that information together. Like I said, I think it's tremendously helpful for directors to have a understanding of sort of what tomorrow is going to look like. And um, it feels as if not um, a rock was left unturned. So we appreciate that as well and, and look forward to the rollout tomorrow. We're going to uh, now move to unfinished business and tonight there is no unfinished business, which takes us to section 13.0 new business. We have two items of new business tonight, starting with 13.0 approval of resolution 1245 district reopening suspension of policy. And I believe Mr. Gunn is going to introduce this. I will. Um, so the, uh, this resolution allows the superintendent or designee to suspend board policies as necessary to implement the district's uh, school reopening plan or to comply with written guidance relating to, to the safe reopening of schools while containing the COVID-19. Um, and the, these um, guidances, this guidance would come from the Department of Health, Department of Labor and Industries, or the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. This resolution provides the district the flexibility needed for the actual reopening of school and to be able to pivot as needed to differing instructional models based on changing health conditions. Um, this flexibility is crucial as these health conditions may change in our county, which could prevent us from implementing our own reopening plan or require that we return at times to a remote learning at a later phase. So it's really going to give us a lot of flexibility. This uh, resolution was developed 
in negotiations between WASDA and the State Attorney General's Office and reviewed by our own in-house counsel. Um, and also this resolution will sunset on December 31st, uh, 2020. And it's worth noting that a similar resolution, um, resolution 1227, it was the emergency suspension of policy in March that the board approved. That one expired on June 19th. So this is a, essentially a replacement, a very similar um, resolution that allows us to suspend policy as needed to respond to changing conditions. And that's the extent of my presentation. I do not have a PowerPoint for you. So at this point, I'm prepared to um, respond to any questions you might have. Thank you. I think um, this came to us late. I hope directors had an opportunity to see it in the Friday report. Um, we felt like we really should get this in this meeting versus waiting for another two weeks um, as it's critical as Mr. Gunn said in um, providing the district the flexibility that we need to implement our educational program. Do directors have any questions regarding resolution 1245? Okay, hearing none, I would like to call for a motion to approve resolution 1245. So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded to approve resolution 1245 district reopening suspension of policy. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we will move to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The resolution is adopted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next item of business is 13.02 Schedule 1400S, Board Annual Regular Meeting Schedule 2020-21 School Year. And this is pro proposed revisions. Let's see, I'm checking to see who's providing an overview. Dr. Salzman? Go ahead, go ahead, Madam Chair. Can you guys hear me okay? And to Darlene, who'll go over the calendar with you at this time. Does we, do we have I, I can go ahead and give the brief overview, yes. which I believe yes, directors uh, know. This, um, the dates of our annual meet, annual regular meeting schedule have been updated to comply with our policy, which um, defines our regular meetings as the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. And then during our summer workshop, we also um, had discussion and uh, chose to move our regular scheduled meetings from 4.30 p.m. to 5 p.m. Um, to offer a little bit more flexibility to our community and parents to be able to attend our meetings, uh, either um, via Zoom or uh, hopefully again in person. So um, are there any questions regarding these changes in dates. I do have a point of clarification for Dr. Salzman or perhaps Darlene. Are we approving this tonight? I notice it's as a first reading, but it was my understanding that we wanted to go ahead and take a vote on it so that we could move to the new uh, board meeting time next meeting. Yeah, so you'll need to agree to waive the second reading and vote tonight. Okay. Do any directors have concerns with waiving the second reading? Hearing none, I would like to call for a motion to approve the schedule, the board annual meeting schedule for 2021. Move to and to waive is that one motion? I didn't think we had a motion. Had to make make a motion. I think. Do you want us to make a motion, Darlene? I don't think that you need to make a motion to waive the second reading. You just move it straight to second reading and then vote on it. All right. All right. So I move to um, to approve, given the waiver of the second meeting. Second. Is there a second? Second. It has been approved to waive the second reading and to approve the, the updated schedule for the 
annual regular meetings for the school year of 2021. Is there any further discussion? Yes, I think on a couple of months there, the meetings were listed as the second and the fourth Tuesdays. And those were also changed in addition to the time of the meeting being moved to 5.30 versus uh, four th five o'clock versus 4.30. So what we are approving then is not only the time schedule, but also the dates, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, we will move to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. The meeting schedule is adopted. Thank you. And that takes us to upcoming agenda items. Dr. Salzman. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. At the September 22nd regular meeting, we'll discuss the following. Instructional materials overview, adoption of the schedule, strategic planning process overview, impressed accounts, warrant cancellations, early childhood education and assistance program contract, 2019-2020 CTE program evaluation and surplus technology equipment. That is all. Thank you. And then uh, we move to section 15.0, executive and closed session. And tonight we do not have an executive or closed session, which takes us to 16.0 adjournment. And I just want to make the comment uh, before we adjourn that if one thing has become clear through tonight's presentations and board meeting is how hard all of you have worked to make this a success tomorrow. And I just want to say thank you so much. Um, you're rocking it. <laughs> so we look forward to tomorrow's adventure. <laughs> and um, at this time, I would like to adjourn the September 8th, 2020 regular board meeting. Thank you and be well. Bye. Thank you all. Thank Have a good evening. Thank you.